Well, uh, thank you very much, Helen, and um, and thank you all for turning out in uh, such numbers. Uh, it's, it's a bit overwhelming, to be honest. Uh, it's over 50 years since I did my first presentation, I'd say, to Awfully History on the, the history of Philipstown. Uh, I had a tape recorder, I think something called an epidioscope, which projected see-through sheets onto onto the wall and I had a, a projector which was worked by hand. It was a disaster. <laughs> anyway, we, we, hopefully this will be an improvement. Um, I'm just going to look back briefly to the end of the 19th century and a few of uh, Jane Shackleton's uh, it, it, photographs. These are from a wonderful book, uh, Jane, Shackleton, Jane Shackleton's Ireland. And in 1894, she travelled with her family uh, down the canal and took some splendid pictures. So we just look at two or three of these. And I think you'll get the impression that the canal at that stage is in fairly good state, fairly good order. Uh, the company at that stage had 70 uh, trade boats, four tugboats, one of which you see here and five large vessels and paid an annual dividend of 4%. So it seemed to be in pretty good order. I put question marks after Kilina because there's a Kilina on the canal in Kildare as well. But the caption here says awfully, so I think we can take it. But wherever it is, it's an important photograph, the tugboat and this whole idea of a uh, sort of... Uh, convoys of barges uh, coming down the canal, which must have been a great sight. This is Shannon Harbour. Uh, well, some activity, uh, much more so than in the 60s and so on. And of course, the, the great range of uh, warehouses that were built early in the 19th century. And this is Rahan, possibly David uh, Sherlock's railway line here, some of which is still to be seen out in Kilina. Uh, and I think that's his depot there um, for his peat, peat works and so on. And Sherlock was to be very important. And I'll just allude to him later on uh, because I didn't really get into him for this presentation. So, 1911 and 1913. Two strikes. <clears throat> the first one is um, the bulkers, the people, the men who loaded and unloaded the uh, boats in St. James's Harbour were dismissed after they had refused to handle timber from a merchant whose men were on strike. Now this is in September 1911. A fortnight later, there's a standoff, and a fortnight later, uh, a boat is loaded by the clerical staff and about to leave St. James's Harbour when it is obstructed by a large and threatening crowd. The following day, a man intervenes, the Reverend John V. Hughes of Phillipstown. He knew a lot of the boatmen because he had lived in Robertstown and Lowtown. So he met with them and they were willing to negotiate and willing to go back to work. But the company insisted that they would sign a document. And whatever it was, even Father Hughes went to the great length of writing out his own version of a settlement. But the men would not sign. He persisted all, he really put great... Um, his heart and soul into this, he's travelling up and down from Dangan, uh, back up to, to Robertstown and so on. And it was on the Saturday when he nearly had them ready to sign in Robertstown. Unfortunately, it was a Saturday and there was a funeral and some of the men became inebriated. And a few, to quote himself, a few malcontents got the better of them and dissuaded them. Anyway, the priest <coughs> continued his efforts. He suggested to Henry Waite, or Harry Waite, the, the engineer, to come and meet the boatmen, and they would give a verbal undertaking that they would resume work and abide by the conditions. The engineer was willing to do this, 
but I'm afraid the company were not agreeable and it would not be done under any circumstances. So the strike, the standoff continues. And then on October the 24th, that's we're almost a month later, the boatmen signed the company memorandum. The boat started up and headed for James's Harbour um, near Houston Station in Dublin, but they refused to handle the cargo unless it was delivered by the bulkers who had gone out on strike. Fourteen bulkers were reinstated, but the five malcontents remained dismissed. And poor Father Hughes, he appealed again and again. I'm getting all of this, by the way, from the Grand Canal Minutes, which I might talk about later. The, anyway, he gallantly made numerous appeals for reconciliation, but the company remained obdurate and the five malcontents were not reinstated. Some years later, uh, in February 1915, when mm -hmm. Father Hughes was retiring in Dangan from ill health, the company subscribed £5 to his testimonial. And I don't uh, quote that uh, to denigrate him. He, he really made a genuine effort to bring the, the, two, the two sides together. But the, the company were quite strong. Two years later, when James Larkin here in the hat, uh, and the, the great lockouts in Dublin, uh, the workers were probably better prepared and so on. And there was a particular standoff out at Robertstown. And it involved a man from Tyrone in Pulla called Jim Taylor. Taylor took a brave stand, and this is vividly remembered in a poem which, for the moment, for the moment, is anonymous, but we may have a suggestion as to who wrote it. Strikers were preventing a boat from moving off from Lowtown Lock when a sergeant from the RIC produced a pistol. Now, a young Taylor stood up to the gun and he is commemorated in... This is a 13-verse poem. I'm only going to read uh, five of them, I think. And I think it's quite good, so bear with me. So this is James Taylor of Tyrone, Tur Tyrone in Pulla. First verse just gives us the setting. O oh, James the street did echo with Larkin's bugle call, and for the rights of Irish men we rallied one and all. Those tyrants Tough and Allen were left in sad dismay when they closed the gates behind us as we struck for higher pay. Tough by name, tough by nature. He was the manager of the canal and uh, Alan was the cashier. The next verse refers to Hatch and that's Hazel Hatch and a lovely name, the Bog of Moods. The Bog of Moods is very near Robertstown. That, it's, a place, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place named Moods and there was a bog there. So I'll just move on to the next verse. There was a boat for Ballin the Slow in Hatch lay anchored tight. Scabs and traitors formed for to steal her in the night. We watched her through the darkness until the morning clear when our picket on the Bog of Moods saw 49 appear. There was a man from Pulla. Jim Taylor was his name. Let him be recorded in history's scroll of fame. He held on to the horse's head, undaunted by the foe, no threats would make young Taylor the bridle reins let go. And there was Sergeant Houlihan with a pistol in his hand, all ready to fire upon that young unarmed man. With a musket placed against his breast, the cowards saw no fear. In bold, in bold and manly Taylor, a boy of tender years. He opened wise his jacket and pointed to his heart. He said, come on. I'm ready now, and I've no wish to part. Come and send me on that long journey to abide eternity, and a dreadful swift and just revenge will send you after me. He won the battle bravely. We're ready now again to work for honest labour without either sword or pen. We'll rally round the standard of our union, loyal and brave. We'll defy those cursed tyrants or fill an early grave. 
So I don't know what else was involved uh, it, that year on the Grand Canal locally as part of the, the great lockout. But um, in a meeting in November, the Grand Canal Company declared that the general strike led by Larkin and so on had cost them £11,011. Jim Boney Taylor. Uh, just before I move on for that, this man here was, of course, uh, on the left you have Jim Larkin and on the right you have uh, William Martin Murphy, his nemesis or great opponent. Martin Murphy, William Martin Murphy was uh, owner of newspapers. He owned two hotels in Sackville Street or O'Connell Street, which would be destroyed four or five months after these, or four or five, uh, in, in 1916. Uh, his two hotels would be destroyed. So, and he was also a director of the Grand Canal Company and would come to Offaly in 1916. Um, I thank, uh, as always, uh, there are great groups all along the canal, uh, great communities uh, who, who look after things, tidy towns uh, and so on. And there's great research being done by groups. And in particular, I would, would mention the, the Puller Heritage Group, their great uh, book on the Puller Bricks. And I was delighted to get uh, Noel Devery uh, gave me these, this memorial card or mass card um, at the uh, at the weekend, and it's of James Taylor, uh, Tyrone for band. So, <clears throat> working out the mats, James Boney Taylor. He started in school at the age of eight in 1892. On the 1911 census, he was 28, and is described as a boatman. So he was young, but he was 30 years of age in 1913 when he entered that standoff against the gun uh, so bravely. He died in 1962, aged 79. Uh, I'm not, uh, Noel, I'm not, uh, we were talking about the word Boney or the nickname. He's got a very nice tall stature here. And that may be the origin of his name. But um, <clears throat> Seamus Dooley of... The, Seamus Dooley, the journalist, I think if I remember what he said to me late last night, that uh, James Boney Taylor uh, may be his grandfather. I'm not too sure of that. But he is a direct uh, uh, ancestor of him, and he was a flautist, and he used to play Bonaparte's Retreat. So that may be the origin of that. So uh, that's really all I have to say about that, that standoff. Um, and I thank uh, Noel and others in Pulla for all the uh, the help that they give. Um, <clears throat> I'd love tonight to be able to talk about all of these gentlemen who are connected with Pulla. Kieran Farrelly, Colonel Dopping. I don't know what to make of Dopping. I was up in the archives last Thursday, or, I think, or Friday. And I was looking at a particular period, and Dopping is making overtures. Dopping has a boat uh, on the canal, and he's making overtures to the Grand Canal Company. He wants to look at their maps. He wants permission to do this. He wants permission to do that. But for some reason or other, they have a great antipathy to him. So Dopping needs more study. Jim Taylor also needs more study, and of course, Purser Griffith and Carol Bryan. So you have all these great characters, uh, for one reason or another, connected with the uh, with the Canal and Pulla. And uh, all I have to say is, uh, well, there's a lot of research to be done, but the Grand Canal minutes could provide um, a lot more if when we get back to them. And of course, this is the beautiful church of Pola, built around this time, 1907. Moving on to 1913, this is the remains of uh, a footbridge that was built uh, in 1914. In, 19, uh, in March 1913, uh, Father Michael Conlon writes to the Grand Canal Company asking permission to build a footbridge for his parishioners and for the benefit of school children. If you know your Rahan, it's a shortcut just across from this side to the far side 
and you're over to the schools and the church and so on. Permission was given with the usual proviso of a shilling a year if desired and that the company would be indemnified from liability and so on and that the the following uh, July, three months, four months later, uh, Father Condon, sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek, he says, he, he writes to the Grand Canal Company again, and he wonders if they could see it in their way to put down the foundations for the bridge. Um, and the reply he got was that they could not see it in their way, but to show their support uh, for the enterprise, the girders for the bridge, now gone, uh, would be carried free of charge. So as you walk along the new greenway here on the far side of the canal, just somewhere around there, you'll see these the remains of these sort of informal inscriptions in sort of concrete. 1914, I presume, and the Reverend M. Condon. So that's just uh, just something from the minutes as we move along. 1916, how peaceful is that? Isn't that lovely? Serene, calm, and a few nights later, you got that. So what happens here at Eden Derry? Out of Eden Derry, you have this enormous embankment. Sometimes the canal is cut through in a cut, like a railway cutting. Other times the banks have to be built up. Now, it is virtually impossible. When you're walking here today, that's taken last year or the year before. You, you, you're you, you've, uh, tow path, it, path each side. Canal is well overgrown. Everything is calm and peaceful. And you can't really see that you're walking on a huge embankment. Looking at the Ordnance Survey, I take it to be 200 yards wide, several miles long, three or four miles long, and 20 feet above the surrounding fields, where you have this sort of container of water, a channel of water, held up artificially on a huge embankment of peat. And for whatever reason, whether it's subsidence, or rough weather, or heavy rain, and the canal begins to overflow. And once it begins to flow out, or flow through, that's it. Everything begins to move. And that's what happened, this embankment. This is in 1989. It happened <clears throat> seven or eight times. It happened when it was being built, 1799. Again in 1833, again in 1849, here in 1916, and again in 1975 or 77. I got contradictory notes today, and last of all, or most recently, and well, quite a while ago now, it happened at Eden Derry. And when the water gets going, it just shoves everything aside. Now, it could not happen in a worse place. If you have a breach on the canal, on a short level. The level is the length of canal between two locks. That's fine. But this is the great long level on the Grand Canal. 18 miles of water plus the uh, branch to Kilbegan. So you have 25 miles of water ready to pour away. But it didn't. This is the area uh, the, where this breach happens. It's called the Blundell Aqueduct. Now, an aqueduct we would, is normally where we take water over water. You're taking the canal over a river. But this is different. This is, this is you're, it's just, the, the canal is up on a huge embankment, and it's just this, this you know, old piece and soil underneath. And it's so big that the road from Eden Derry to Rathangan goes under it. So that gives you an idea of the enormity of this huge embankment. So you have a road here going under the canal uh, just, just south of Eden Derry. Harry Waite, <coughs> the <coughs> aforementioned man who was well who was who was quite good with Father um, from from Philipstown. <coughs> uh, but here he is the essence of calm. 
the breach happened on a Monday night and he has to meet the directors every Wednesday and he has to have a report for them. So I think on the first Wednesday, he says, although about four miles of canal was run off and the flooding is extensive, still it is low bog pasture and I do not think there will be any claim for damage. There were past masters at handling claims. The night, the day before it breached, they had just finished work on a breach at Bracklin, out in Ballycommon, near the Wood of O. And uh, I think it was Mr Finlay <coughs> got a small claim and they were able to handle that. It was just five or ten pounds and so on. But it was ironic, it was just that day and that night uh, the canal chose to breach again. Now he is the essence of calm and everything is sort of restrained. The newspapers were not quite so restrained. So, Leinster leader later on in the week. The scene of the canal burst at Eden Derry has been visited by thousands of people during the past week. And visitors from all parts of the country have motored there to inspect uh, the remarkable site. They all of them admit that no description however graphic, could have prepared them for what they saw. The havoc wrought by the muddy rushing water, the enormous force that must have forced it outwards, the utter impotence of the protecting line to resist the pressure and the great cataclysm that resulted. What everyone seemed to consider especially remarkable was the fact that greater damage to the property uh, was not done and that the only injury was caused by the flooding which was now subsiding. There can be no doubt that if the breach had occurred in the middle of the night, I'm not too sure what time it was, when, anyway, when, when people were asleep, the results would have been far more serious. The great line of water lying between Edenderry and Ballycommon, together with the branch line to Kilbegan, constituting 25 miles in length, would have found its way through the breach and flooded the whole countryside. As it was, only a portion of the country between the canal and river was flooded for a few days. And that river, of course, was the Boyne. So it was well able to sort of, although at the upper reaches of the Boyne, it was well able to take the floodwaters away. So that was the Leinster leader. An article released from the Associated Press by Federal Wireless on the following Saturday carried a screaming headline. Ireland flood does damage of three million. The short report declared that the canal had burst, sweeping houses, cattle and crops away on an irresistible torrent. Less dramatically, it reported that there was no loss of life and in conclusion it stated that the damages were to cost three million pounds. This is Mr. Waite's assessment of the damages. He reckoned everything could be repaired for £5,599, eight shillings. And the only claims that I can detect in the minute books amount to less than £200, £184, including legal expenses. But this minute here, Probably uh, one of the Thursdays afterwards, uh, after the breach. Six motors for 12 weeks, 200 men, 240 pounds for 12 weeks. Carpenters, 5,000 cubic feet of piles. So there was an enormous job of work to be done. And although it was January, they set about it with great gusto. Now, just to look at some of the pictures, so you have 200 men, 12 weeks, 29,730 cubic yards of filling and 5,000 cubic yards of piles to be driven. So you've got to rebuild up. You know, it's not just a question of piling up peat and soil and so on. You've got to consolidate it and so on. And as Ruth Delaney says, you know, when 
you know, wh when you think of uh, building the, the Grand Canal or any canal, you think of the aqueducts, you think of the bridges and you think of the locks. But she said the most impressive part of the building is when a canal has to cross the bog. It was one of the most difficult engineering feats attempted before or ever since. It took nearly 10 years to complete and many times the engineers felt like abandoning it for another route. So here, here to the engineers, because if they hadn't crossed at Eden Derry, it w we wouldn't be giving a talk on the Grand Canal in Offaly. It would have gone elsewhere. So well done to them. Uh, this is another shot, I think, of 1989. And uh, I, <coughs> I left school <coughs> sort of early. But it was uh, early in the, uh, it was early, I think, in the new, in the year. And by the time I got over, my slides were, were rather poor. But I can remember standing near some of these. They're almost the size of a house. Huge sods of earth just tossed aside. And only four miles. The weight was right. There was 25 miles of water. But I reckon only four, mi four or five miles of it escaped. And we'll see why uh, in a moment. So just some shots from 1916 of the workforce. And I'd imagine that's a pile driver. Uh, I'm absolutely useless at engineering and the language of engineering. So uh, I remember trying to do, giving a talk here and I came over with uh, Kieran Keenahan and he says, are you all set for the talk? I said, yeah, pretty well. I just ho hope. Nobody asked me, how did they get the canal through the bogs? So we were, Stephen McNeil, Lord of Mercy, and was here chairing it. And Stephen says, has anyone, any, so we, we will have one last question now. And Kieran says, how did they get the canal through the bog? <laughs> anyway, we were able to do that to each other. So. so this is why a lot of the water did not escape. When there is a breach, you have a set of boards that are put down into the grooves here. So uh, the local inspector, Mr. Uh, A. Rourke, uh, he was very prompt and courageous, and he put down the stop boards or the stop gates, and uh, he stopped a lot of the water. So he was to get a bonus from the company, but the bonus was suspended because... Um, I think he was drinking a bit. So uh, this is a minute, uh, again, a lovely minute, uh, ordered that the payment of the bonus be suspended. Uh, uh, and if his conduct is satisfactory for three months and he is strictly sober, the board will consider giving him a bonus to mark, isn't this lovely, to mark their approbation of the promptness and courage with which he put down the stop gates at Colgan's Bridge at some risk to himself. Anyway, that's Colgan's Bridge, just at the uh, just east of uh, the aqueduct, uh, the tunnel uh, at Edenderry. Uh, I'm sort of straying out of my uh, comfort zone now here. It's to do with the canal, but it's looking at the sort of uh, civil war and all of that. Um, and uh, I got a, a list of um, compensation claims for County Offaly during the period, um, yeah, so, so, July 1921 until May 1923. Uh, there were 434 claims, 84 of them for raids on boats, 36 in Pulla, 50 in Rahan, some of them overlapping, 11 involved Guinness, 10 involved tobacco, and 75 of them were sort of credited to the uh, anti-government forces. Um, okay. Now, I don't mean to demean the efforts that were going on. There was a bit of whiskey and a bit of Guinness and a bit of tobacco, but there were serious claims as well. Count Louis de Warner Hammond uh, for his house in Ballycumber, a claim for £34,673.50. 
15 shillings. Uh, not so much the house, I think, as the factory and outhouses were destroyed. O'Connor Morris for the house at Gortnamona, 17,385, seven shillings and ninepence. And the barracks at Rahan was also burnt, um, 1,300 pounds. So that's just a brief look at the claims that were made uh, during during that that interval. 1925, just a passing moment, the appointment of Joseph Cummins to the 29th lock, the 10th of September, 29th lock. And this is a photograph, I'm not too sure when it was taken, probably in the 60s. I think it was, I think he, he won a prize in the early Tidy Towns competitions for having the best lock on the Shannon line or something like that. And it's a very evocative photograph and it's one that I'm particularly fond of. I don't know, am I right in saying that Patsy is his daughter? Yeah, yeah thank goodness, right. I do get things mixed up. And she was wonderful, a wonderful lock keeper. And you, the, the unusual thing is, uh, you have a daughter succeeding a father, and this happens, as we will see elsewhere. And it's so important that she did, because not only there's a job, but more importantly, perhaps, there's a house, and th th these things are important. Uh, she was a great friend of my mother's and a great friend of all our family, and she's someone that we're very fond of. I was delighted when the Inland Motorways Association had a floating festival in um, Tullamore in 2015, that she was the person of honour, and I just thought it was a wonderful thing to do. So, moving on uh, to the 1940s. Yes, <clears throat> a visitor from England. And I don't think we could have got uh, a sort of a, a better visitor in, in many ways. Tom Rolt, or LTC Rolt, um, the founder of the Inland Waterways Association, the British Inland Waterways Association. And, of course, a great writer. And this is his great book. Uh, green and silver, and it sort of uh, it traces the journey on the the Grand and Canal, the Royal Canal and the Shannon, uh, in 1946. So he's coming over to Ireland, landing in Waterford, getting a train to Athenry to go to Athlone. Anyway, that's fine. He was fond of train journeys, as you can imagine. He's in Athlone, and uh, it's just after the war, so it's no great surprise that things did not run smoothly. He gets a boat, um, Le Co, uh, uh, whose engine had been long silent, and of course there's a great shortage of fuel. So while he's uh, awaiting, he goes to Galway and Connemara and so on, and he ends up possibly in Sean's Bar or certainly in a pub in Athlone, and he's telling people what he's doing. And he says, I'm going to go down the Royal Canal, up from Athlone, up to Lanes towards Lanesborough, uh, Richmond Harbour, and onto the Royal Canal, down to Dublin, and then cross the Liffey and back the Grand Canal. Someone says, you can't do that, because there's a lock very near the Liffey that's not working or something like that, or Tim, it might be the Effin Bridge, that length of railway line that is lifted and so on. So he decides that he better check things. So he rings the Grand Canal Company the following morning, and they say, we don't own the Royal Canal, we own the Grand Canal. What are you doing anyway? I'm going to go down the Royal Canal about... Oh, no, no, you're not. You're not. No, 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 no. He says, where are you? Athlone. Well, you better come down to us first because you better go into the Grand Canal first because we're closing the canal for two months. What two months do you think they close for? July and August. Anyway, Rhodes does that and he, he just gets into uh, Shannon Harbour a day or two before... Um, before uh, work starts. He's just 
pulling in to Shannon Harbour, he looks over onto the right and he sees balks of timber, heaps of gravel, shear legs, portable air compressors and pumps. Some major works ahead. So here is Shannon Harbour in splendid sunshine. So what was going on in Shannon Harbour in 1946 when there wasn't much else going on elsewhere? Shannon Harbour had for years been a place of transshipment in the sense that canal boats would come to Shannon Harbour and then maybe unload onto the tugboats and be brought onto the river and across the lakes and so on. So the two locks that sort of connect Shannon Harbour to the Shannon, it's at the terminus of the canal, had been built to allow these steamers, these tugboats, which plied the Shannon, to come into the harbour. Now, at this stage, <clears throat> that was grand when the, horse, the, the boats were horse-drawn, but we're now in the 1940s, and most of the boats were mechanised themselves, and they could sort of go on the river sort of between Athlone and Port Humda. But sometimes the lakes, Loch Ree and Loch Derg, could be very tricky uh, and indeed uh, maybe somewhat tragic. Anyway, this was to all end in November 1945, when a decision was made to replace the canal boats on the river between Shannon Harbour and Nimerick with two much more powerful vessels. Transshipment would return to Shannon Harbour. In January 1946, two vessels were acquired in Bristol, the Avon King and the Avon Queen, and they were bought for £5,000. They looked for £5,250, but my dad didn't we get them for £5,000, and we did well. The steel barges were 85 foot long, 15 foot 6 wide, which meant the locks at Shannon Harbour had to be further enlarged, and there, that is still evident today. A transshipment store and office would have to be constructed. And in June 1946, it was determined that these works could be done by the company's engineer and staff for £1,953, 14 shillings and twopence. And that is what Rolt observed uh, as he passed through Shannon Harbour. Anyway, that work was done quickly enough. Progress was also made in securing the vessels from Bristol. And a lot of formalities had to be gone through after affixing the company's steel on the barges and the appointment of the company's manager as ship's husband. Uh, arrangements were made to tow the barges across from Bristol to Limerick. And this took place on the 8th of October and what happened to two boats, the Avon King and the Avon Queen? What happened on the way over? They were canonised. When they arrived in Limerick, they were the St. Patrick and the St. Bridget. Two electrical hoists were also bought uh, from Herbert Morris of Lockborough to provide the mechanical means of handling the goods and so on. In October, a new agent was appointed to the harbour and so on. And in November, an agreement was made with Messrs. Thomas Thompson of Carlow to erect the transshipping stores and overshed with the necessary girders, roof trusses, glazing and asbestos roofing. roofing. And all to be installed, etc. 4,000. So a huge investment of about £11,000. Edmund, uh, is it Edmund, Mike, Desmond Williams? Yeah, anyway, one of the, Desmond Williams, I think, yeah, was, uh, was one of the directors and he was particularly involved in all of, of, of uh, that transaction. The transshipment shed now is gone. If I used to come out over here, that might be part of the stores and so on. But the transshipment shed was there, to the, oh, well, not too long ago, but it's, but it's gone now. Unfortunately, but there you are. <clears throat> As I said, um, Rolt was a very uh, astute observer of things. Uh, he leaves Shannon Harbour and he's heading for Tullamore and so on. And um, 
Am I right? Yeah. Just up beyond Belmont, he comes on this really magnificent uh, aqueduct. Uh, this is the aqueduct over the Silver River. That's the South Silver River, the one that comes from the Sleeve Brooms to Ballyboy and Cormac, not the one that's in Doro and Ballyduff and so on. Um, anyway, he is very, very impressed. And I, I always like to quote this description of the masonry, of the work that was done uh, 220 years ago when they were building uh, the Great Canal. It was on such an embankment that we travelled for some distance, crossing over the Silver River by a stone-built aqueduct, which, as we saw from the inscribed stone on the parapet, was called McCartney's. Without exception, all the Irish canal works are of stone and are of truly massive proportions. Unlike our, meaning the British, English, uh, unlike our brick-built bridges and locks, which tend to crumble with age, these rocks, built on a monumental scale with great blocks of hard, fine-grained fine -grained marble grey limestone of the central plains, are as sound as the day they were made. They are an endearing tribute to the craft of stone masonry. And to get that coming from someone of the stature of Tom Road, I think is great tribute indeed. So moving on to the 50s and 60s. This is the last minute. When I first began looking at the Grand Canal minutes, possibly 50 years ago, we used to go to Houston Station, to meet the station master with the one arm and the red rose and that nice gentleman and he would look after us as best we could but at that stage the grand canal minute books were in the bowels of houston station you went down four or five flights of ladders and it was very dusty but they were warm and they were dry they're now happily in the uh, National Archives of Ireland in Bishop Street, uh, just off Wexford Street in Dublin, very near St. Patrick's Cathedral. The minute books, there's 121 volumes. They're indexed and, of course, they're dated. They are minutes, after all. And this is the last minute which took place on the Thursday, the 17th of August, 1950. And it's a very short meeting, and I think it's a very sad one, I think. Um, yes, I think I was, yes, on the 17th of August 1950, the board met for the last time, and one week later, on the 25th of August, the final meeting of the company was held with the shareholders. In his address to the company, John McCann, the chairman, stressed that the board had not sought the amalgamation. The government had more or less, they had an investigation into transport. CIE had been established in uh, 1945 and they had control of the Royal Canal and now the Grand Canal are being more or less ordered that they would have to merge with CIE and they're a bit reluctant to do it. Anyway, in his address, John McCann, the chairman, stressed that the board had not sought the amalgamation nor had it looked for assistance from the government. Anyway, uh, the end was practically in sight at that stage. So that's it, 1950, and that's the last minute. They are an incredible source uh, for awfully history because, well, you know, you couldn't get a better length going right through the county. Eden Derry, Bally Britain, you know, Killeen, Cave Mount, Dangan, Bally Common. Capon Corps, Tullamore, right through. Uh, and they're all appearing in, in these 121 volumes of minute books, and I would recommend them to you. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm sort of moving on to the second half of the talk, and it's more personal reflection. I've gone away from the minute books. The minute books have finished, as I said, but they are really good for the construction of the canal between 1794 and 1804 uh, and so on. 
but uh, I'm going to move to, sort of to the last quarter of the talk, uh, sort of it's a personal reflection. I grew up here in Front Half Road uh, in <clears throat> the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and I don't know who would say in, 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 in Dublin in particular, and maybe in other towns and cities, very often the uh, new housing estates um, sort of turn their back on the, the canal, but here at Clontaff Road embraces, uh, as we would do in childhood. It looks right onto the canal and it's proudly, it was a wonderful, um, well, it's just a wonderful playground, uh, fishing, swimming, etc., and other things that maybe we shouldn't have been getting up to, such as this. I wrote the blog on Saturday and someone said, I read your great blog. What is this about the Broster River being ushered under the Grand Canal? <laughs> and I just thought it was an appropriate word. It's a small stream coming in from Ballycommon, uh, Ballydaly and so on. And here it is being ushered underneath the Grand Canal in one of these great culverts. Now, some of these are little aqueducts or culverts. Some of these are siphons. So when you go into them, and the canal comes right down and you can't get through. But in this instance, you could get right through. So this was a, a sort of a daring thing to do when you were seven or eight. And if you wanted to impress visiting girls in later years, you would play hide and seek. Suddenly you would turn up the far side of the canal. And they were wondering, how did he get over there? But there you are, about, uh, about 50 or 60 yards long, just a, a foot or two deep, and well, it was a bit of an, a bit of an adventure. And uh, <clears throat> well, a raft or so on, usually chained and locked, but sometimes not. So we would do our huckleberry thing bit. And uh, I remember once we got, we were getting a new bed, so we were throwing out the old bed, and there was a sort of a wooden frame in a very orange or tangerine wood. I don't know what it was. We just painted that way or so on. So we went to great trouble getting the springs off it. Then, I don't know where we got the timber, uh, putting boards across it, and then getting uh, drums, metal drums, and building our own raft, which we brought down to the end of Clontaff Road and out down uh, under the railway bridge where we launched it. Uh, one brave soul went out. Uh, it, was, it was quite like that. It was water filled after a short time. Anyway, we survived and we brought it back and left it for the following day. Following day, it was gone. And this was the man who rightly got rid of it for us because it was very tricky. Joe Smith, you might remember him, uh, from the 27th lock. Uh, a lovely photograph which I got from Anne Hogan, Anne Horn, I think. And this is just a minute uh, recording his appointment to the 27th lock uh, in uh, the 23rd of October 1944, where he was to succeed his father, Thomas Smith. Uh, we couldn't find our raft anywhere, but a few days later I noticed a very nice pile of timber for the winter with some lovely orange pieces of timber. And I think that's where it was. Going west, that was west of Tullamore, going east of Tullamore, the rotundity of this building. Uh, that's Boland's Lock, um, as was. And uh, well, we just knew of the Boland sisters. I thought they were all lock keepers, but I think it might have been just one of them, uh, Babs, Nan, and Mary B. I'm not too sure which of them the lock keeper. It might have been Nan. But again, like Patsy Cummins at Ballycown, you have this, you know, quite unusual thing in Ireland in the 40s, 50s, and 60s where a daughter would succeed uh, a father uh, in a sort of, a, well, a government job of sorts. And that is the, the restored... Uh, uh, well, so more enhanced uh, version of the uh, the roundhouse at the 26 lock 
built about 1801 or two by Michael Hayes, the contractor. Why he didn't build it like all the other lock houses, I don't know. He certainly wouldn't have done it without authority. But anyway, he had to pay the extra £42, 11 shillings and 7 pence. Maybe we'll find it in the minutes. Maybe it was for himself. I'm not too sure. But that's it. That's it today. And it's a place well worth walking to. I don't know how regular this was, but this is 1947. Uh, and you can see dozens of people out on the ice. And if you look under the green bridge, as we used to call it, you can see two boats caught up in the ice. And I think this was a regular enough recurrence. There was a, a boatman, Tommy, whose name won't come to me, in Banagher. And I said, have you any memories of the Grand Canal boat? No, he said, I, I, I did all my boating on the Shannon. But I did go on the canal once and never again. He said, I was young, I was getting my confirmation and we were going to Burton's in Dublin on, by canal, so he must have had relations on the boats and we were going to Burton's in Dublin to get my confirmation out of it when we got stuck in the ice, <laughs> the far side of Tullamore and thanks to the people of Tullamore that we didn't starve and I thought it was just a nice memory. <laughs> Well, Peter, Jimmy, Jimmy Longworth, uh, holding forth. He's still there. He's still there, yes. <laughs> He's uh, very often at his gate as you go down to Lantarf Road. Yeah. But he had a motorbike. Yeah. And, I, well, as far as we can remember, he travelled up and down the ice canal on the motorbike, so, which we thought was quite a, a daring thing to do. Coming into the 1960s, hard to believe. The Grand Canal was very nearly closed. Dublin Corporation, in their wisdom, uh, decided to put a surface water sewer into the bed of the canal, and then they were going to concrete it over, uh, sort of, I think, it may be sort of doubling the width of uh, the, the South Circular Road, or not, well, the road that goes beside the canal, sorry. And, well, just making a fast-flowing uh, road, and so on. Uh, you had to get permission, fortunately. Sometimes you don't when you are a government uh, agency, but had to get permission, and that tank mercifully took a while, and during that time, and fair juice to them. The Inland Waterways Association was founded. Harry Rice and Vincent Delaney. Vincent Delaney was the first uh, husband of Ruth Delaney, and they organised protests and so on, saved the city line, and it was saved in 1969, and great credit to them for doing that. And moving on quickly just to the 70s and 80s, this is Ruth's great book, uh, pub published in 1973, and about seven years before that, remarkably early, with Vincent, she wrote The Canals of the South of Ireland. And I understand she is still living and still with us. She has made written, I, I would think, 12 more books on the Shannon, on her, her waterways. She has made films, which are now safely in the Irish Film Institute in Temple Bar and so on. And, uh, well, and she was always obliging to come to Offaly and talk wherever, uh, right down through the decades. Another thing which cemented my relationship with the canal was Mike and Heather Thomas's, uh, their great Celtic Canal cruisers. Uh, before they got those, they had two, um, they had two other vessels, which may not be described as, well, what's the canal equivalent of seaworthy? But anyway, <laughs> we, 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 we headed off from the middle of Tullamore, great fanfare, everybody out. And that evening we got to the Thatch and Rahan, fair enough. Following evening we were in Banagher. The following day we were in Athlone. And on Tuesday, in the middle of our holiday, we sent postcards from Athlone. Wish you were here. 
weather beautiful. And it took, it took, see, it's, there's two books on the canal. One is called The Land of Time Enough, and the other is called Time Enough. And uh, the, both authors, uh, when they got onto the boats and began, began to meet with, particularly with the lock keepers, and, and they're dead right. Don't, if you're ever on a boat, don't rush going through a lock. Things can happen. All right? But uh, that was the prevailing attitude. So, <clears throat> the, Mike and Heather got lovely new boats brought over from Bunbury, I think in England. Black Bottoms, brand new boats. They had six or seven Celtic King, Celtic Princess, Celtic Queen, Celtic Knight, Celtic, etc. And I spent holidays on them with Mike Bourne and others uh, on the Barrow, uh, on the Mid Shannon. They're too flat bottomed, if that's the word, to go on to the lakes. And uh, it was just wonderful. And I, I like to remember them both tonight. Their base was out at the 24 o'clock. I think that's one of their sons. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this is a lovely watercolour by Heather, not of the 24 o'clock, but of uh, a lock that's on the barrow, I think, Bally Ellen or somewhere like that. And I was delighted to get, to get hold of that years ago. The canal continued to breach. This is 1975 or 77, the morning after, and this is at Cave Mount. Um, and we went out to that. I think Mike might remember this. We went out. It was a bank holiday, Sunday night or Monday night. And there was a large gathering just outside my house in Tontaf Road of Civil Defence, Order of Malta, and there was an emergency. And we headed. Uh, we got on to something, ambulance or, or other, and we headed out. And we were out there. Uh, for, we didn't, yeah, I think we actually got to the, uh, to the breach. Uh, I think a lot more than four miles escaped. And again, because it's on a, a high embankment and it's usually surrounded by low-lying lands and so on, all the waters escaped into the Fijile, yeah, the river that goes through, through, uh, through Dangan and so on. So that's 1977. And again, just another shot of um, Eden Derry. And costs have risen cost over one million pounds. Uh, aquatic plants were transplanted which to prevent wave erosion and so on. But I always think it's slumbering there and waiting. Anyway, let's hope not. Um, perhaps I think uh, coming near the close, um, the greatest achievement in the 80s and 90s was uh, the, the whole restoration work that was done on the Kilbegan branch of the Grand Canal shared between Offaly and Westmead. There are just magnificent buildings there, 20 buildings of great heritage significance. And if you walk it, uh, you get through eskers and boglanders, hedgerows, wetlands and so on. And it is greatly cherished between Ballycommon and Kilbegan. And it's great, uh, a great credit to them. And just some pictures of that. Uh, the bridges on the main line, the Shannon line, are grand. They really are grand. But the bridges on the canal, the Kilbegan, are magnificent. Magnificent cut stone. And there's ten of them between Kilbegan and Ballycommon. And they're all in great order. The harbour, up at the top, harbour master's house. And just a painting that's inside the warehouse. But it's the quality of the stonework. This is a lovely culvert. Just as you go out the line from Kilbegan, you come to an area that's fenced off and you go down into that and there's a holy well. And right beside the holy well is this little culvert which takes the stream under the canal. The remains of a crane. And this is a crow's foot from the Ordnance Survey, a bench, benchmark on top of the copings and I think all of the bridges have this feature, uh, which is lovely to see. And that's just one of the fine uh, doors on, on the, the canal warehouse. I, I don't know where I gave a talk on it, uh, probably in East Offaly, Eden Derry or somewhere. And someone said at the end, 
that was very, very good now. That was very good. But you made a terrible mistake. And I said, what? He says, this. you never told us there was no water in the Kilbegan Canal. And there's no water. But that, in many ways, that's a horizon to look forward to. Um, when they were building it, the, uh, the <clears throat> aqueduct over the Silver River gave enormous trouble uh, to William Dargan, who became a great... Uh, railway engineer, and uh, he fell out several times with the uh, with the, the canal company. They he wanted to hand it over as a finished job, and they wouldn't take it, and so on. And there was a lot to do with the aqueduct at, over the Silver River. And another horizon to look forward to, is, and it's it's going really great, is the the Grand Canal uh, Greenway, um, a great walking and cycle route. Uh, I mean, go to it, uh, go to look at the facilities at Dangan or go to look at the facilities in Pulla for walkers, the parking and so on. And it's well on the way to uh, to completion and it will bring a lot of walkers and cyclists, hopefully, to along the canal and into Offaly. Uh, this is just some recent shots, much improved now. Uh, works have really improved. This is just west of uh, Pulla, heading towards Tehran. Uh, the car park on the right and the gates um, which are coded so that the farmers have access to their to their fields and so on and that's the old police barracks uh, in Pulla and I was just there last week and there's a very nice bench here now for people who wish to rest and so on again typical of Pulla that you, you would get that done so quickly and that's just the car park there just and there's the uh, the cycling track, walking track, uh, west of Pulla, moving on down towards Tehran. I, I think Frank Turner is at the back of the room. James Martin. Uh, James Martin. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have to wait for the Greenway. Uh, they've been walking it <laughs> well for decades and always seem to be enjoying themselves when, whenever I meet them on, on the line. So long may they continue to do so. So that's more or less it. This is Chontaf Road facing proudly onto the canal um, designed by the great T um, keep mix Gib Frank Gibney, the great, uh, and just an architect who had a social consciousness and you know gave us really very fine houses and gave us a really fine um, childhood by, by just making that decision. His houses in Kilcormack and Rochford Bridge uh, had, had the same social vision, so we were greatly indebted to him. I close with a poem written by a friend of mine who lived at what we call the split, sort of, sort of that house there, number 33, Michael Henzey, who no longer with us, and he was a, he was a fine poet, and uh, when he left us, I heard that his manuscripts were still surviving. So we got together and we published his poems. So this is just a short one. Grand Canal Tullamore. I used to love to sit by the old lock gate and hear the tumbling waters roar in carefree dreamy boyhood days in dear sweet Tullamore. The summer air held a magic rare with a charm the soul to enthrall and the rest in the restful eaves among the spangled leaves on the green grassy banks of the Grand Canal. Thank you. <laughs>